Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Benny. Today, we are going to react to a true crime TikTok compilation video. Get your detective caps ready, because we about to solve mysteries. Let's watch. So this girl was on my fight, and she had a lot of likes. So I checked the comments to see why. 14-year-old Claire Miller was arrested early Monday morning for stabbing her older sister who was wheelchair-bound and had cerebral palsy. After murdering her sister, she called 911 hysterically explaining what she did. When police arrived, they found Claire outside covered in blood as she was washing the blood off of her hands in the snow. Claire did cooperate with police and told them where her sister was. She was found in her room in a pool of blood with a pillow on top of her, and when they removed the pillow, there was a knife stuck in her neck above her chest. I'm assuming her sister fought back as the affidavit said that the sister was found with her hands above her head. She obviously passed away with multiple stab wounds, and there's also no motive as to why her sister killed her. And her page is still up. It takes anger at siblings to a whole new level. Hi, I'm Gam, and this group of friends thought they were opening a suitcase full of cash, but it ended up being anyone's worst nightmare. On August 19th, 2020, a group of teens went random nodding on a West Seattle beach. They stumbled upon a black suitcase. Immediately, they smelled the most putrid odor. They opened the suitcase and saw that something was wrapped in a black garbage bag. They decided to call the police. What the teens found turned out to be the bodies of 35-year-old Jessica Lewis and 27-year-old Austin Wenner. Autopsies revealed that Jessica had been shot multiple times and Austin had suffered a single gunshot to the torso. They had both been beaten and dismembered to fit in the suitcases. The couple, who had been together for eight years, had been killed two months prior to their discovery. The killer? 62-year-old Michael Lee Doodley, their landlord. On June 9th, Michael let another woman move into Jessica and Austin's apartment. When she entered, there was heaps of clothing everywhere. Under a pile, she saw the figure of a person and a bloody hand sticking out. She made a joke out of fear, and Michael laughed. Michael told authorities that the victims hadn't paid $1,500 for rent. He also has a restraining order from his own daughter because he sexually assaulted her. Man, this guy looks like a nice guy too. This just goes to show you that you can't trust anybody just by how they look. The dark side of Reddit. This picture contains Reddit posts from the least disturbing to the most, and we're starting with tier six. Today I f***ed up by admitting to my girlfriend that I pretend she is a giant cockroach when we have sex. Ever since I was a teenager, I've had very intense fantasies about having sex with a giant roach. Really gives a whole new meaning to the word cockroach. OP his balls to prove a point. Four years ago, a guy from Croatia posted this image claiming he had found a homemade electric chair. Now people in the comments didn't exactly believe him, so he did the only logical thing. Man used the chair to electrocute his balls and proceeded to upload a picture of them. I came home to find this in my driveway. And while people in the comments were concerned, they all agreed, open that shit. Well, he did, and inside was a key along with coordinates to a cemetery in Germany. If you want to go down this iceberg yourself, click the link in my bio and you can explore. What the heck? Why would anybody want to fry their balls? Is something else. I bet I can make you hate this guy in 60 seconds. This is Alice Herlichka, and he was a collector for the Smithsonian Museum in the early 1900s. And if you're thinking, oh, this is the dead-eyed stare of someone who was up to no good, you'd be right. See, Alice had collected 268 brains for the museum to display, and about 264 of those brains were from people he targeted. So for example, in 1904, Alice went to the St. Louis World's Fair to hunt for some targets. That's where he found an exhibit of Filipino people who had been trafficked to America, basically for white people to gawk at. And the whole thing was tragic. People were forced to eat dogs in front of people, the conditions were just terrible. And as a result, some of the people who were brought here died. These people were hastily buried, so Alice dug them up, stole their brains, and brought them to the Smithsonian Museum. And that's all because he was a huge supporter of eugenics. He wanted to prove that their brains were actually smaller than average. The Smithsonian still has a lot of these remains and they don't know what to do with them. They've publicly apologized, but it's really hard for them to tell what remains belong to who and how to contact their families. I hated him when I first laid eyes on him. Cannibal facts that'll eat at you for days. Part three. In the year 2000, a Chinese performance artist named Zhu Yu prepared, cooked, and consumed a human fetus as part of an art piece. In 1981, Czechoslovakian serial killer Ladislav Hoer confessed to killing a young woman and cutting off her breast and vagina. 
He tried to eat the latter with mustard and later admitted to throwing it away because of its underwhelming taste. In 1939, an Italian woman named Leonardo Cianciulli murdered three women and turned their bodies into soap and tea cakes, which she ate and fed to her close friends. In the 18th century, there was a man called Terrare who had an endless appetite due to unknown causes. His condition led him to eat 15 meals in one sitting, along with live cats, snakes, lizards, and puppies. Further, he once ate an entire eel without chewing, piles of garbage, and a 14-month-old baby in a French hospital. What would drive someone to eat freaking people, man? I never understood that. This YouTuber was sentenced to 10 years in prison for possession of CP. This story is really disturbing and I'm going to show you some court transcripts so viewer discretion is advised. So Austin Jones was a YouTuber that was known for making acapella covers of emo songs and pop songs. And in April of 2015, Warped Tour actually announced that he would be on tour with them. So at that point in his life, Austin was becoming famous and that got to his head. And the real Austin soon creeped out. So when Austin was first announced as being a guest on Warp Tour, that's when the accusations about him started. People came out and said that he had been messaging minors online, asking them for twerking videos. And this quickly led to a petition being started that got over 4,000 signatures to have him removed from Warp Tour. Now, immediately Austin went on the defensive. He released a statement saying, yes, I did ask fans for twerking videos, but sometimes I'd send them videos too. And he said nothing ever went beyond asking for that. He also then made a video saying, yes, I did do this, I did ask fans for twerking videos, blah, 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 but then talked about how he'd been depressed, he had a bad life growing up, more crap. But in 2017, Austin was arrested in Chicago, and that's when the world really got to find out just how terrible this guy was. So I'm going to show you some of the transcripts from court showing his actual messages to minors. Like, look at some of this stuff he says here. Um, hey Austin, it's my name, and this butt is age years old, and then make it clap for 30 seconds. I seriously recommend you pausing this TikTok to read these paragraphs because they're crazy. But he basically was asking these, yes, young girls to make twerk videos. But he wasn't just asking for that, he was asking for a lot more. Some of these chats got extremely, extremely graphic, and he would make very specific requests of these teenage girls. I mean, I'm not going to read some of this stuff out loud, but just read some of these first paragraphs. And in some of these videos, he would specifically request that these minors state how old they are over and over again. I mean, actually reading this and reading his messages to these girls is so disturbing. And the sad part about all this is that he did get these minors to actually send him these videos, so he had a massive collection of CP at the time of his arrest. Now, the one silver lining in the story is that this pedophile was caught and he was arrested and he was sentenced, but only for 10 years in prison. And I think for how much he screwed up these young girls' lives, he should have gotten a lot more. Those are all the behaviorisms of a predator right there. Not good. Photos of victims right before their death, the case of Brittany Gargo. On the 24th of March in 2015, best friends Brittany and Cheyenne got ready together for a night out. They then took a selfie together and posted it on Facebook before leaving the house for the evening. However, this would later come to be the last ever photo taken of Brittany. The two young women then went on a bar crawl in a busy and popular area of Saskatchewan in Canada. During the night, Brittany met and hit it off with a local man. The two friends ended up losing one another and Brittany went home with this man she'd only just met. Cheyenne tried to get hold of Brittany on Facebook to find out where she was, but was unable to get a response from her. Cheyenne reportedly messaged Brittany saying, Where are you, Brittany? Haven't heard from you. Hope you make it home safe, and I need my phone. Love ya. It wasn't until the following morning that Brittany would be located. In the early hours of the 25th of March, a man driving alongside a landfill site discovered the body of a young woman on the side of the road. He could tell from the colour of her skin and her cold temperature that she was no longer alive. She had thick marks and bruising on her neck, which led him to believe that she had been strangled to death. At first, police were unable to identify the body. However, the young woman had some very unique tattoos, and so authorities made these known to the public in an attempt to identify her. Cheyenne soon contacted police, concerned that the body they found may be that of her friend Brittany. 
They then confirmed that it was in fact Brittany Gargoyle who had been murdered. Cheyenne then gave a detailed recollection of everywhere her and Brittany had been that evening. To try and discover who Brittany had left with that night, police checked all CCTV footage of the bars that Cheyenne and Brittany had visited. But when they watched the footage, they could not believe what they saw. Or in fact, what they actually didn't see. There was absolutely no sign of either of them on the tape where Brittany supposedly left with an unknown man. Which means Cheyenne must have lied to the police about where they were. This discovery led investigators to look further into the relationship between the two girls. And when they took another glance at this photo, they noticed something horrifying. At the crime scene, a black braided belt was found near Brittany's body, and it was identified to be the murder weapon in this case. This same belt was worn by Cheyenne on the night that Brittany was murdered. This was then confirmed by a witness who told police that Cheyenne had confessed to them about murdering Brittany. In actual fact, the two friends ended up in a heated argument that night. Cheyenne then hit and strangled her best friend to death. Cheyenne denies having any recollection of killing her friend. However, at her trial in 2018, she pleaded guilty to a charge of manslaughter. And she's now serving a seven-year prison sentence. What do you think about this case? Follow for more true crime. Dang, that was a plot twist. I did not expect that. Today we're going to be talking about lobotomies. A lobotomy is a brain surgery that was initially made as a last resort for mental health patients that didn't respond to other treatments. They weren't initially seen as a cure, but instead as a treatment to help the quality of life of the patients by reducing their symptoms. Lobotomies include severing or damaging the connection between the frontal lobe from other parts of the brain, usually being the thalamus. They were believed to be able to treat a variety of different things, including schizophrenia, depression, aggression, bipolar disorder, intellectual disabilities, homosexuality, criminal insanity, brain tumors, and more. Back when the lobotomy procedure was created to all the way to when it was at its prime, there weren't medications that were used to help alleviate mental disabilities, and psychotherapy was still in its early stages. A very basic summary behind it is that they believed that the frontal lobe was in charge of aggression, hallucinations, and other symptoms, so they would just sever the connection. Later on, the more popular belief came from Walter Freeman. He believed that psychosis came from excessive self-reflection, aka overthinking. And lobotomies were quite literally the way to cut it off at the source. Since the concept was created in the late 19th century, it evolved slightly, giving us three different main types of lobotomies that we know today. The first is the tepectomy, which was created by a German psychiatrist named Gottlieb Burkhardt in 1891. He initially began by removing parts of schizophrenic patients' brains and found that it made them quieter. To him, this showed that he helped the patient's quality of life. However, the medical community rejected him and lobotomies didn't come back until the 1930s. The next style of lobotomy that we're going to cover is the leucotomy. This revision led so that way it didn't have to be open brain surgery. Instead, two holes were drilled into the skull and ethyl alcohol was injected into the prefrontal cortex which disrupted the neuronal tracts. Later, after more testing, this technique was revised again and instead of using the alcohol, they used an instrument that could cut the connection between the frontal cortex and the thalamus. This technique was created by Portuguese neurologist Antonio Moniz and his colleague Almeida Lima. Once they started this technique, it didn't take long for it to get all around Europe and then the U.S. And for their technique and their research, they won the Nobel Prize in 1949. The last form of lobotomies we're not really going to cover because it's after everything else we're going to be talking about, but it's called neuroinjection of sclerosing agent, and they actually use this in other parts of the body as well. Now we're going to get back to the leucotomy. Once this technique reached the United States, neurologist Walter Freeman and neurosurgeon James Watts modified the procedure to make it less invasive. For them, it started where they worked together and they used electric shock therapy to make their patient unconscious. Then, they would drill a single hole into the patient's skull and sever the connection that we talked about earlier. Then, Freeman decided to revise it again, and this time, he was able to do it by himself. Beforehand, he would still use the electric shock therapy to make the patients unconscious, and then he used a tool that looked like an ice pick that would go through the eye sockets and pierce the brain. The procedure usually took about 10 minutes, and he believed that with this method, it could be done in any condition with little equipment. And I ran out of time, so if you guys want to hear more, let me know. What how crazy the world is getting? Do you guys think we should bring back lobotomies? Serial killer facts that'll haunt your nightmares, part five. When Peter Curtin was just 10 years old, he had his first sexual experience with a goat, and the years that followed, he would regularly do it with other farm animals. At age 13, he killed his first person and would murder over 60 more. In the 1910s, Bella Kiss killed 69 people and tried to pickle them. 
And when police found their bodies in barrels, they had puncture marks on their neck and they had been drained of all their blood. Pedro Rodriguez Filho killed 71 people both in and out of prison. He was released a few years ago and now has a YouTube channel where he makes fishing videos. Cannibal killer Albert Fish enjoyed shoving sewing needles in his pelvic area while he touched himself. And before his execution in 1936, a medical examiner found over 30 needles in his pelvis. Andre Chikatilo, better known as the Rostov Ripper, was originally captured but had been released due to a one in a million genetic condition that caused the blood type in a sample to be different from the blood type in his semen. Man, that guy that killed people and then he turned his life around and filmed YouTube videos? Fishing? That proves that people can change. That still doesn't do it right though. That still doesn't do it right. This 14 year old boy is one of the UK's most dangerous killers. I'm True Crime Caitlin and this is the murder of Joe Galen. Today's case takes place in Bury, Manchester in 2006. Joe is an 11 year old, very well liked, charismatic boy who loved everything to do with football and had cystic fibrosis. On the 1st of March, he receives a handwritten note from 14 year old Michael Harmer who had told Joe that this was a note from the deputy head teacher. The note instructed Joe that he had to go home with Michael that night, that he was his mentor and that his mum was going to pick him up from there after school. Joe had mentioned the note to teachers who had questioned it not believing that it had actually came from the deputy head teacher. This teacher was partway through advising Joe not to do it when the fire alarm went off. Disrupting the conversation and forcing all the students to evacuate the school. Michael had in fact fabricated the note in order to lure Joe back to his house. He had developed some sort of obsession and fascination with Joe and maybe experienced some sort of jealousy towards Joe. Michael was quite the opposite of him. He was very reserved, very quiet, and he didn't really have any friends. When the boys arrived at Michael's house after school, he proceeded to make sexual advances towards Joe. Joe rejected these advances, calling Michael gay and threatened to tell everyone in school what Michael had just tried to do. Filled with rage and probably feeling extremely embarrassed, Michael picked up a frying pan and proceeded to bludgeon Joe with it. He whacked Joe a total of five times with so much force that it had broken his eye socket and broke the pan. After retrieving two knives, Michael would go on to stab poor Joe 16 times. Some wounds were up to eight inches long and he had been stabbed in the neck, face and his upper body. After murdering Joe, Michael dragged his body downstairs, hauled him into a bin and began to wheel him to nearby Whitehead Park. This was at around 4.30pm. Back at their home, the parents of Joe began to worry. He wasn't the type of boy who would wander about after school, he was very rarely late and he needed medical treatment for his cystic fibrosis that without could be detrimental. They knew that something wasn't right and at 5.30 p.m. they contacted the police and reported Joe missing. Thankfully, the police took this serious immediately and launched a search. Meanwhile, Michael had gone home and was completely normal. He'd ate his tea, done his homework, had a bath and then proceeded to sleep soundly in the bedroom where only hours prior he had committed murder. The search went on late into the night, however it wasn't until the next day at around 10.30am that the body of 11 year old Joe Galen was found by a police dog hidden under some debris. It was clear to the officers that found him that he was the victim of a vicious killing thus turning the case from a missing person to a murder. People who were with Joe the day before or had any information on him whatsoever were all questioned. One of these people included Michael. He admitted that he had seen Joe the after school, but that they had only just briefly spoke in the street before going their separate ways. But this didn't sit right with some of the school staff. 
Michael was changing his story and then remembering the note, this just didn't add up for the staff. Within an hour of finding Joe's body, Michael is escorted out of the school and is arrested. Initially, he did try to deny any involvement with Joe's murder. However, after a few hours, he made a full confession. A search of his house would find the note that lured Joe to his house, along with several other ones where Michael had wrote his sexual interest in Joe. At Manchester Crown Court on the 16th of October, Michael pled guilty to murder and was given a life sentence with a minimum term of 12 years to serve. This was later uplifted to 15 years. In 2016, he made a plea to have his sentence reduced, which was denied. He was able to apply for parole in March 2021, but I couldn't find anywhere if he had or if he has been released or not. Next week will mark 17 years since poor Joe was callously killed. He was a happy, bright young boy who did not deserve the end he was met with. Let us hope that he was not released because that poor little kid did not deserve that. I just got an alert from our neighborhood thing saying, urgent alert, missing white cats. Please go look outside. It's an emergency. We don't have a flashlight with real batteries, but I do have my LED panel. So let's go look for this cat. Look how cute she is with her headlamp. <laughs> This is why I told my mom that I need slippers with a sole that goes up over the edges, uh, specifically for looking for cats out in the snow. This just in, the cat's name is Tofu! <laughs> it's so cute! Tofu! <laughs> tofu! <laughs> Apparently the cat is, like, way so far away. There's no reason it should be out by our yet. house. At least not yet. He's never been outside before. <laughs> Did you say a thousand dollar reward? Yep. But we gotta we gotta go back out. We gotta go back out. I'm sorry, I gotta get my coat. We gotta find we gotta find tofu. I'm gonna go find tofu too. I'll see you guys later. It's always nice when these uh compilations have a nice moment. Gives you a break from all the horrific things you just watched. Well guys, that was the video. Thanks for joining me today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment on what you guys want me to react to next. And I will see you on the next one. Peace.